even after Flagler had retired, he was still making money. It was just pouring in like the oil did. Henry Morrison Flagler had always been successful. He was a former partner of John D. Rockefeller and a multimillionaire. Now retired at 75, he was bored. Florida historian Irving Eister. He liked Florida and he thought there was a wonderful opportunity, so he built a hotel. Then he bought another hotel and then he decided, well, you had to trans have transportation to get to the hotels. So he bought out the railroad. Now Flagler had one last goal, to extend his railroad from the mainland to the far end of the Florida Keys. But the task was huge. The Keys were scattered over nearly 140 miles of tropical swamplands and volatile seas. Soon, vast working villages sprang up along the route and were filled with 5,000 men as construction headed towards the coast. But almost immediately, work slowed as uncharted lakes and dense jungle frequently set the crews back by weeks at a time. Crews became dispirited, many deserted, so Flagler made regular personal visits in his paddle steamer, encouraging them onwards. Half the railroad's length would have to be built over the ocean using 42 bridges, often many miles long. Work fell behind, the cost went up, but Flagler insisted they stay on schedule, even through storm season. It was a gamble he lost. In 1906, 160 workers died when their sleeping quarters were ripped apart in a gale. With deaths becoming commonplace, American crews were increasingly unwilling to work on what was called the railroad that went to sea. To avoid strict government safety laws, Flagler employed hobos and illegal immigrants and began his seven-mile bridge, which actually had to span nine miles. Hundreds of piles were driven into the tough coral as the bridge and Flagler's dream rolled on. But each year, winds would smash miles of completed track, yet more men would drown Still, the message kept coming, this thing will be built. As his health failed, Flagler challenged his men to finish a year early, and finally on January 21st, 1912, the last span was lowered into position. The 140 miles of railroad that everyone said couldn't be built was finished. Critics had called it Flagler's folly, but as he made the epic first trip from Miami, the triumphant Flagler proved it was anything but. When his train pulled into Key West, Thousands of jubilant well-wishers gathered to meet him. Flagler was proclaimed a hero. Stepping into the throng, he was heard to say, I can die in peace now. Just a year later, he did. Flagler's railroad was a success. On Labor Day, 1935, all this was to change. On the morning of September 2nd, Meteorologists began tracking a storm, moving west towards Cuba. A severe weather warning was relayed to shipping in the immediate area. Throughout the day, the storm grew, and by 11 a.m., not only had it started to change course, it had also become a hurricane. The new course was plotted heading northwest, directly for the Keys. On Isla Morada, immediately in its path, Bernard Russell, then 17, recalls the storm moving in. We had been through many hurricanes before. We did the normal thing of, pro of protecting life and property. And, but um, this was so much greater than the one that's, that we had been before, but we didn't know that. So we did the normal thing. My dad had a large lime grove. We had a packing house that was built to withstand hurricanes. And normally that's where we went. As the storm advanced on the islands, terrific winds began lashing the coast, and the decision was taken to close the railroad. The first front of the hurricane struck the island at 2.30 p.m. with immense force. About 3 o'clock, we entered the, the, the hurricane shelter and buckled down for the night. Further up the highway, 600 war veterans were celebrating Labor Day. By 4 o'clock, Winds were topping 100 miles an hour, and the veterans started to gather here, at the time the station platform, now the post office. They didn't think it was going to be that bad, and when it began to look like it might, they asked for a relief train to come down and take the veterans out, and anybody else that wanted to. On the mainland, the train took two hours to get steam up and link with its coaches. It didn't leave until 4 o'clock. The delay had cost vital minutes. 
So the train was held up for several times. And then when it got to um, Florida City, they decided it would be better to put the engine on the other end of the train so that they could get out easier. And that took a while. The full fury of the hurricane was now battering the coastline. And by 6.30, even locals were arriving on the platform, ready to evacuate. But the train had only just stopped at Windley Key, miles further up the track. There was a quarry there, and there was a big um, boom with guy wires. One of those had broken and got tangled up in the train gear. So it took an hour there to get the train loose. The sky was black, and the sea had swelled, cresting over the tracks as the train neared the station. The train got into Isla Morada, I think it was 8.15 or something, and 8.23 was when the, the tidal wave came across. Rising up 17 feet, the tidal wave raced across the island and smashed directly into the train with colossal force. Rail cars were flung onto their sides. The track itself buckled, twisted, then ripped apart. The helpless passengers with no defense were crushed by the onslaught. Meanwhile, floodwaters rushing across the island had reached the height of the hurricane shelters, built on stilts eight feet above the ground. Bernard Russell and his family were beginning to fear the worst. I said, Dad, there's muddy water coming in under the door. Then also I'm thinking that we're behind the railroad and that we're, we're sitting here in about eight foot of water. The entire island is completely covered and winds blowing 250 mile an hour. There's not too much can stand against such a thing. Now during this time, when we left this, the shelter, Dad said, grab a hold of someone else and hold on to him. Don't turn him loose. Well, my little, my oldest sister had a little boy about two years old. I wanted to take care of him, hold him and let her hang on to me. She had a death grip on him and wouldn't turn him loose. Now remember, it's black, you can't see. And uh, so I grabbed a hold of her and she grabbed a hold of him and we held him together. And we went out the door and we went out of the door, we were separated just like that. The wind just spun us around and threw us. But in the distance, I could hear a voice. And I told them to keep yelling, keep yelling, and I'd see if I could find them. Well, it seemed like that it took me about three to four hours. And I kept yelling and yelling, and, and, I, and I kept crawling, doing the same thing until I got in, it was my father. But I could see the train. It was over, but I could see it. So we decided that we were going there for protection. The train lay on its side, a short distance from the local diner, which was largely intact. Known as the Green Turtle Restaurant today, that night it became the focal point for people tracing lost relatives. Most families on the island had lost someone that night. For Bernard Russell, the tragedy was greater. Out my family, we had nine in the building, and two of us came, three of us came out alive. Out of 63 members of his family, 52 had died that night. At first light, the survivors looked over their shattered island, all asking the same question. Why had this hurricane taken so many more lives than those in the past? Many islanders already knew the answer. Flagler's Railroad. In the rush to finish the railroad, Flagler had ordered his men to avoid wasting time building bridges. Instead, they simply filled in the sea between some islands. During the storm, with nowhere for the water to go, the sea surged as a powerful tidal wave, smashing into the helpless islanders. Over the next three days, rescue teams recovered so many bodies, the cemeteries in Miami refused to take any more. Funeral pyres burned for days, as the extreme currents around the Keys gave up yet more dead. When civilians returned, one of the first things to be built was this monument. Beneath it are the ashes of hundreds of residents and veterans. Bodies were interred here in such numbers that authorities are still uncertain exactly how many people there are. At the monument's dedication in 1937, thousands were united in grief, the dreadful result of one man's obsession. It was not only people who died that terrible night. The dream of Flagler's Railroad died with them. After it had been blamed for so much devastation, the railroad never ran again. And they warned him and told him that when they were building the railroad, that eventually that they were going to drown the people like rats. 
which really did happen. For the people of Isla Morada, Flagler's dream had become their nightmare. His railroad that so proudly went to sea had now died at sea, taking with it the lives of over 500 people. Would you believe it? 